You know, kids, the late, great Terry Pratchett once said, give a man a fire, keep him warm for a day, but set fire to him and he'll be warm the rest of his life. And it's with that thought in mind that on today's lesson, I'm going to give you guys some fuel to stoke your own musical flames for a lifetime. Because if you don't know the major scale, you've got a major problem. I'm Uncle Ben, and this is why you suck at guitar. Hey kids, it's good buddy, Uncle Ben. One of the most important things that any musician can do is learn the major scale inside and out. And that's one of those things that whenever I tell my more, you know, kind of metal oriented students, they kind of wince a little bit because that's the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, happy sounding scale that we never really use in metal. But trust me, whenever you learn the major scale, you're essentially learning the entire, you know, genome, the DNA strand of everything that there is to know in Western music. Typically in music theory, whenever we're talking about other scales or modes of any kind, we usually talk about them in terms of how they're different from the major scale, you know? It's like a major scale, but with this little change. So whenever you learn the major scale, you're kind of learning the default template for every other scale on the planet. So with that being said, don't let the fact that it is the happy sounding one dissuade you from spending the time to learn it and understand it thoroughly. It's the essential building block of everything that we do in Western music, so it's worth your time. On today's lesson, I'm going to show you guys five different ways that I learned how to play the major scale over the years that helped me thoroughly understand it and visualize it across the entire fretboard of the guitar. This is extremely useful stuff for any player of any experience level or style to add into their musical toolbox. Charts and tabs for this lesson are available over on my Instagram page at Ben Eller Guitars. Just search for This Is Why You Suck at Guitar 18, find them, and follow along. Downloadable tabs, backing tracks, bonus lessons, and more are available to everybody that supports my channel over on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Guitars. You can visit the page by clicking the link in the video description, find the tier that suits you the best, and start reaping the benefits today. Thanks. Numero uno. Linear. Learning how to play the major scale left to right across a single string like I just said right there is one of the most crucial parts of learning and understanding the major scale really well. See the problem is whenever you learn scales in those big vertical box patterns like this, it can kind of hide from you what's going on inside of that scale as far as like how far apart the notes are and what the pattern is and stuff like that. But whenever you play it going left to right like this, you can really see just how far apart every note in that scale is and start to figure out what makes it tick. For all the examples in today's lesson, I'm going to be using A as the root note for all these scales. So we're going to be using different A notes all over the board here. So the major scale is just made up of a series of whole steps and half steps. Whole steps being these two fret intervals and half steps being little one fret intervals. And the major scale, again, any major scale, whether it's an A scale or a B scale or whatever, is a set pattern of steps and half steps, and it's really easy to learn. So I'm going to be starting off here on the second fret G string on our A root note. I'm going to play an A major scale by playing the order of steps and half steps that go into a major scale, which is set in stone and is the same for every major scale in the world, whether it's a F major scale or a D major scale or whatever. This series of steps and half steps is always the same. And it's easy to remember too. Start off on your root note. Again, I'm using A. Play two whole steps, followed by a half. Then play three whole steps, followed by a half. Okay, so again, that's root, whole step, whole step, half step. Then your three whole steps, followed by a half. Now after that last half step that we just did, you end up back on the same note that you began on, just an octave higher. A scale isn't like a straight line. A scale is more like a circle or a racetrack, you know, where as soon as you cross the finish line, you're on your next lap of it again, you know? So after you do that series of two holes and a half, three holes and a half, you end up right back where you started. So that means you could potentially go root note, step, step, half, step, 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 half. And again, you're back at your root note again. So you can restart that whole series there. Root note, step, step, half, step, step, and you know, a run out of frets after that, but it could keep going for infinity. Two steps, half, three steps, half, repeat. This works from any root note. I could play a different A note, like my fifth fret high E string, 
and play that same series of step, step, half, step, 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 half, and it'll yield the same results. Notice that as I went through that, I wasn't talking about fret numbers or anything like that. We weren't going two, four, six, seven, nine, eleven, whatever. I think that way of learning is like trying to memorize the phone book or something. It's just worthless. Yeah, you can sit here and memorize an A scale as two, four, six, seven, or whatever, but as soon as you change strings, that's not true anymore. And as soon as you try to play a different scale, that's not true anymore. So just learn it as a series of steps and half steps and let the fretboard numbers be irrelevant. I really like learning and illustrating major scales this way because again, when you play a scale like this vertically, it's just so much harder to see that you're going root note, step, step, half, step, step, step. Then you're on root note again, step, step, half, and so on. It's a lot harder to see that whenever you're playing it this way. But whenever you do it just across a single string like that, it's much more clear to see. Great for all your favorite Ingve style one string rippers too. Number two, the standard form. So I think the first way that I learned how to play a major scale was using what we call a standard form scale pattern. Standard form scale patterns like this are handy because they just take place across four frets. So that means they're pretty easy to play anywhere across the fretboard in any key. And pretty easy to visualize because they're nice little boxy patterns. Now as we go through this, I'm going to be talking about fingering numbers right here. That way, again, you don't get too attached to what fret you're on, but rather just thinking about a one finger per fret kind of mentality. First finger will be playing this fret, second finger is responsible for all the notes on that fret, third finger is on that fret, fourth finger is on that fret, and so on. Uh, once again, I'm going to be starting off with my root note as A, my fifth fret on my low E string. And I'm going to be playing that with my second finger. So again, as I call these out, I'm not talking fret numbers, I'm talking finger numbers, okay? I'm going to play 2-4. The next string I'm going to play 1-2-4. Next, I'm gonna play one, three, four. Same thing again, one, three, four. On the B string here, play the same stuff you played on the low E. Two, then four. And then lastly, on the high E, I'm gonna play one, two. Okay, so that's two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, one, three, four, two, four, one, as you play through that pattern, you're still playing that same series of two steps half, three steps half that we played whenever we learned the one string one. Again, it's a little harder to see, but as you go through there, you're still doing the same stuff. So that means that after you play root note, step, step, half, step, 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 half, this is the root note again. You know, you'll notice that after every seven notes, you're back where you started once again at the root note. So as you go through this, just be thinking, it's not just this that's the root, you know? Every seven notes, you're gonna pass by the root note again. That's important for a lot of different reasons. Root, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root, two, three, four, five, six, seven, root. It's kinda of like how they say that like military personnel and police officers and stuff like that are trained to know where all the exits in a room are, you know? I think every guitar player should know where the root notes in their scale patterns are. Those are really handy and really relevant to know, especially if you're playing over like let's say an A chord and you're using this A major scale. Being able to play a lick where you land on that root or maybe one of the other chord tones is always a good idea. Just because you're in the scale and in key isn't necessarily enough. You need to stick the dismount and land on a note that's in the chord that you're playing against at that time. These standard form scale patterns are great because they're easy to visualize and just think of the fingering combination of 2-4, 1-2-4, 1-3-4, and so on. Also great dexterity builders if you're looking to build up you know, your skills with your hand fingers over here. I also like these because it's easy to visualize a chord shape in them, which means, again, more cool tones that we can land on whenever we're soloing against a chord. Like for example, whenever you play a regular A major bar chord, you end up with like five, seven, seven, six, five, five, right? It's really easy to visualize that chord shape just hiding inside of this scale pattern. Five, seven, seven, six, five, five. It's all hiding right there in the scale. So that can kind of clue you into some cool notes that you can land on while you're soloing against an A chord while using an A scale. Any of those are gonna work because they're right there in the chord shape. 
One thing that a lot of people already know is that whatever you play in one position of the guitar neck, you can play the same stuff but 12 frets higher, right? So if this scale pattern works on fret number five, like we're doing it right now, if I play it 12 frets higher on 17, it's gonna work there too, right? But the problem that a lot of us have is that we end up with these really big separate islands of stuff I know. You know, it's like, here's a scale pattern I know down here. Here's that same scale pattern again, an octave higher. But in the middle of those two, there's kind of this no man's land, you know what I mean? But this is where you can use the stuff that you picked up in the first part of the lesson with the linear major scale to connect those two things. Anywhere that you find a root note, again, knowing where the root notes are is very important. That's why I'm gonna color them in on all the charts. Anywhere you find that root note, you can start that linear sequence of two holes and a half, three holes and a half, and connect your islands of information. Check it out. Okay, so that's a root note right there, right? There's A, so let's just walk up that string. Root note, step, step, half, step, 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 half. And now I'm up in this 17th position box of notes that I know. You could also do that from right here. There's a root note. Step, step, half, step, 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 half. And I'm just connected these two different spots on the neck. Numero dry, the pocket octave shape. Okay, essentially what this shape is, is it's the top part of the scale pattern that you just learned. Only we're gonna learn how to apply it on every string set. Every scale you learn, you should be able to play a simple little pocket-sized one octave shape. I'll tell you why in a second. But essentially what we're doing is we're doing that shape that we learned a second ago, where we start off on the root note with our second finger and play two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, okay? Now, learning how you can apply that shape to every other A, in this case, on the neck, is gonna be extremely important. But basically the cool thing is, is whenever you learn these little one octave shapes, you can put them on any string set and apply them there. This is really important because so many guitar players only learn scale shapes starting from the low E string. And they can only think about starting that scale if it's starting from the low E. And that is a huge, huge problem for a lot of players that can really hold you back. So whenever you learn how to use these little pocket octave shapes all over the neck, that means you're gonna be able to sniff out root notes for whatever scale on whatever string you happen to be close to at that time not always just relying here on the low E string. Okay, two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four. Now you can put that on another A and play the exact same pattern. Let's say the 12th fret here on the A string. That's an A note. And check it out, you can play two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, and it's that same scale. Okay, now let's put it here on the D string fret number seven. This is where we're gonna run into some problems because of the tuning of the guitar. Okay, so if you try to play that same pattern you've been playing, two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, you get into that dangerous zone that I call accidental Holdsworth. Sounding like Holdsworth is cool, obviously, but only when you mean to. If you're trying to play over just a nice A major chord and you're playing the wrong scale shape, that gets a little dicey. Because of the tuning of the guitar, which is mostly fourths, but with this third between the G and B string, you essentially always have to alter shapes whenever they are crossing over the B. Notice that our first shape and our second shape looked and felt identical. Well, it's because they didn't cross over the stupid B string. Every time we cross over the B, we've got to shift up one fret to accommodate for that weird thirds tuning going on between the G and B. So check it out, you're still gonna play two, four, starting here from the seventh fret D, two, four, one, two, four. But when it's time to go one, three, four, scooch up a fret, one, three, four, okay? Two, four, one, two, four, scooch up because of the B string, one, three, four. It's a pain, but just learn to live with it. Or be like Tom Quayle and tune all fourths so you don't have to deal with it. We could also start off the scale pattern from the two on the G string, the A note that we started our linear scale with. Only here, again, check this out. If you play the usual two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four shape, definitely accidental Holdsworth territory again. So we gotta change the way that we play this thing because again, the B string will immediately scooch up whenever it gets to there. So I usually play it like this. Instead of starting with two, four, I'll start with one and three because the next part of the scale is going to go one, two, four, one, three, four. It's got a nice straight edge down here at the bottom. Nothing creeps up or jumps down a fret. One, three, four, one, three, four, one, three, four. 
three, one, two, four, one, three, four. Learning these one octave scales is so important and will really free up a lot of, you know, RAM space in your brain so that you can just play wherever you are on the neck while you're improvising or whatever. And not always be trying to think about what, you know, gigantic six string scale pattern you're in when you're just playing here on the bottom strings, you know? There's no need to load up all of this data when I'm down here. I'll give you an example. Let's say I was playing over some cool, like, jazzy chord changes that change keys or something, right? Like maybe A major seven. Like a C major seven. Now, a lot of guitar players that just know, you know, big shapes, they would think about playing the A scale against the A major seven chord. And then when it's time to play C major seven and play the C major scale, they gotta start thinking about, well, time to jump up here to fret number eight. Because I know there's a C note right here on the low E string fret number eight. A lot of guitar players get in that habit where they just shift from this big box to this big box back and forth, and that sucks. But the cool thing is, is if you know how to play these one octave pocket scale patterns, you can play the ball where it lies. Here's what I mean. If I'm playing against the A major seven and I'm using the A major scale. I might do something like that again, ending on a root note. Then let's say it's time to go to the C scale. Well, you can see position wise, I'm nowhere near the starting point of that C scale here on fret number eight. So how about instead of that, I just find this C note that's here on the G string fret number five. That's a technical viable root note, so I'll use that one octave scale pattern there. Again, adjusting for the tuning. One, three, one, two, four, one, three, four. Again, from this C note. Why think of this C note? I'm nowhere near that. I'm closer to this C note, so that's where I'm gonna put that scale starting. So again, I could play something like A scale to C scale. Root note A, root note C. Again, really excellent to learn those one octave scale patterns for helping you play over tough chord changes. And the cool thing is, is it's really easy to just link them together from root note to root note to root note and make these nice little easy to think of pockets of scales all across the neck. Number four, Shredder's Delight, three notes per string. Ah yes, the three note per string scale pattern. One of my absolute favorites and most used things in my bag of tricks. These scale patterns are great for making cool sequenced, you know, Paul Gilbert style burner licks. Uh, they're also great because they cover a lot of sonic territory. They cover more range than the standard form scale pattern that we did. And the other great thing is because it's a uniform number of notes per string, three on every string, it's a little bit more predictable to pick than the standard form ones, which are like two notes, three notes, three notes, three notes, two notes, two notes. That can be pretty difficult to negotiate with the pick. But when there's the same number of notes on every string, it becomes a little more predictable. And once again, you gotta be starting off here from the low E string, fret number five. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play five, seven, and nine using that big old stretch. Now you'll notice that I played the five with my first finger, the seven with my second finger, and the nine with my fourth finger. A lot of players, whenever they're new to these shapes, like to do it this way and play one, three, four. It's really rare to see guys that actually get good at that. Paul Gilbert does it, but Paul Gilbert has gigantic hands and I don't. Um, so basically, here's the idea. The reason why you should play these as one, two, four is because anatomically, what's easier to do? This, making these two fingers stretch apart, or this, making these two stretch apart? If you're like 99% of all human beings, this is an easier stretch than this is. So that's why I make these guys do the hard work and make this the easy job. Okay, so five, seven, nine. Repeat the same thing on the next string. Five, seven, nine. Next, what you're gonna do is hike up a fret with your first finger and change to this shape. Play six, seven, nine with fingers one, two, four. Okay, so again, I scooched up a fret with my first finger. Just like that. Play the same thing on the next string. Okay? Now, after this, what you're gonna do is scooch up another fret with your first finger. Okay? So think of it as like every time you change shapes, move up a fret. And uh, you're gonna play seven, nine, 10 on these frets using fingers one, three, and four. And then play the same thing on the high E. Okay? So it's. Now here's the thing about this scale pattern that I wanna drive home to you guys. This goes past the root. 
Okay, you remember how I said a second ago that every seven notes you end up at the root note again? Root two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root two, three, four. You'll notice that this scale pattern ends on the fourth note of the scale, not the root, okay? This is something that I see that I call finish line syndrome a lot with guitar players. They think that the highest note in the scale pattern is somehow significant because it's the last note. It's the finish line, right? So I, I hear a lot of times guys will use these scale patterns and they'll get up to that highest note and land on it. But that's not always necessarily a good note to be hitting. Again, it's not enough that it's in the scale or in key. It's also got to work with the chord you're playing against. So again, if you're playing against an A major sound and you're using this three note per string A major scale and you land on that note against an A chord, it doesn't exactly work, does it? You'd be much better off thinking about trying to track your way back down to one of the roots or again one of the other chord tones. The C sharp note and E note are also in that chord. But it's always good to know where those roots are. Again guys, it's the exit doors in the scale. Always know where those roots are. So as you practice through these, really any of these scale patterns, I always recommend not just stopping at the highest part. Drive that car somewhere. Take it back towards a root, you know? Don't just be happy with getting to the top because it's the highest note. Take it back to note you'd actually want to land on if you're playing against that chord. Three note per string scale patterns are great for making you know awesome fast sequenced licks like Paul Gilbert does. And uh, a lot of times they're really simple. It's just like rather than playing three notes then moving to the next note in the scale, play those three notes then play them again. So you get six notes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Because the next string also has three notes on it, you can do it there too. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so on. It becomes easy to make these nice little loopable chains that you just apply to every string. See, as I'm going through that, I'm just applying the same idea to this string set, then this one, then this one. Watch those Paul Gilbert intense rock videos on YouTube, the ones with like the you know, pink background and stuff. Really any of Paul Gilbert's lesson stuff on YouTube is worth a watch to capture as many of those cool scale sequences that work with three note per string scales as you can. Numero cinco, four notes per string. So whenever I think of four note per string scale patterns, I think about Shred Eye Knights like Rusty Cooley who use these to blaze at insane speed across the fretboard. Obviously, as you can see, you cover a ton of sonic ground whenever you play these four note per string scale patterns. I would say one of the most handy things about them is the fact that not only are there the same number of notes per string, but it's an even number. That's really important if you're looking to increase like top end picking speed. Uniformity of notes per string, especially when they're even numbers, is always easier than a randomized you know, scattering of notes on every string. See, when you play the three note per string one, because it's odd numbers, the picking flip flops every string. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And that can be really tricky at high speeds, but whenever you play four notes per string, it's just down, up, down, up on every string. Down, up, down, up, repeat, down, up, down, up. So it makes it all the same for your picking hand if you're looking to do some really fast alternate picked licks across these scales. Now the way that guys like Rusty use these from what I understand is to always play the first note on the string with the first finger, second note with the second finger, third note with the third finger, fourth note with the fourth finger like that, no matter what the spacing of the notes is on that particular string. I guess that would be useful for, you know, just playing straight through a scale if you were doing that. Uh, I think that playing straight through a scale though is the most boring thing you can possibly do, you know? Like just sit here and try to think like what of your favorite solos features a guy playing straight through a scale, you know, not going back or changing up his phrasing or anything, but just going straight through a scale. That sounds like you're practicing in the middle of a solo, which is lame anyway. So I don't really use that kind of fingering myself. Usually the way that I'll uh, use these is to use my little finger and shift up. So I start off feeling like I'm playing a three note per string scale, like five, seven, nine, using that one, two, four fingering that we used. And then for the next note, I'll just scooch up with my little finger, right? Scoot, scoot, like that. Uh, again, you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to, but that's the way that it works for me. Now I'm gonna play this here by playing five, seven, nine, and then 10, okay? 
Next I go to the A string here and play 7, 9, 11, 12. Now because we're putting four notes on each string, you've already played a whole octave of the scale. Root 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, root. Again, always know where those root notes are. So after you reach that point, what we're going to do is to continue with that two whole step, half step, three whole step, half step pattern that we learned initially. We're going to play the D string here on 9, 11, 12, and 14. Then go to the G and play 11, 13, 14, 16. So that's a lot of notes so far. Then we're going to go to the B and play 14, 15, 17, 19. And lastly, the high E string here, we're going to play 16, 17, 19, 21. So that's a ton of notes, but as you can see, it covers one root note, two, three, four octaves in there. So you cover a ton of ground. Great for whenever you're wanting to move just from the low end of the neck to the high end at ramming speed. But again, I rarely ever use them just to play straight through a scale. I'll use them more kind of mixed up phrasing ways, you know? Again, ending on a root note, or a third, or a fifth, or whatever else you want to do. And again, I'd really like to drive it home that no matter what shape you're using, whether it's the standard form, four note per string, whatever it is that you're doing, at the end of the day, it's all root note, two steps, half, three steps, half, back at the start, no matter what. The shapes can disguise that sometimes, but that's always what's going on in any major scale ever. So you got linear, standard form, One octave pocket shapes. Three note per string. And the gigantic four note per string shapes. I would encourage you guys to try to combine these ideas as much as possible. Start off with one of those pocket octaves transition to linear, then maybe that lands you inside of a big three note per string shape that you know, or whatever. Mix these up and combine them in every way possible. And you know, if you want to get some musical benefit out of it too, do yourself a favor and instead of practicing these scales and shapes with a metronome, find yourself a backing track here on YouTube. Just type in A major backing track, or if you're working on your F scales, type in F major backing track or whatever. There's tons of good high quality stuff that you can use to practice these with. Uh, and again, everything's recorded with a metronome, guys. When you play with a backing track, you're still playing with a metronome, you know? Only you get the added musical bonus of hearing where those root notes are and where the important chord tones are and stuff like that as you play through these scales. And after you have a really good grasp of how that scale is constructed as far as where the first note, second note, third note, fourth note, fifth note, sixth note, seventh note, and first note are, it becomes so easy to learn other scales. Because like I said in the intro, we describe all these other scales by how they're different from the major scale itself, right? That's the default template, the basic building block of all music. So let's say you're wanting to learn something that sounds like it would be a completely different scale, like the melodic minor scale. That can seem intimidating and like you're learning a completely different language, right? But the thing is, is when you compare it to the major scale, which again, always start with the major scale. Whenever you compare it to the major scale, you'll find that it's just like a major scale, only with a flattened third note, okay? So take everything you know about the major scale, clearly envision those patterns and stuff we talk about, and just make the third note lower, and that's it. So you could take your linear thing that you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes long, right? And just make that third one one note lower. One, two, and not three, but a flattened three. Keep every other note the same. So the fourth note, fifth note, sixth note, seventh note, first note are all the same. Just flatten that third. And suddenly you're playing around with a completely new scale, just using the knowledge of what you already had about the major scale as the basis. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this mega-sized lesson that should give you enough to chew on for a while. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that bell for notifications every time I put up another slice of fried gold for you guys right here on my channel. You guys can follow me on Instagram at Ben Eller Guitars, Facebook at facebook.com slash Uncle Ben Eller. And if you want to support my channel, please go check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Ben Eller Guitars.
Let me know in the comment section below if you guys would like to see a similar video like this only based around a different scale, like maybe the minor scale or something like that. And uh, we'll crack into that one day in the future. Well guys, it's been fun as always, but it's time to get away from the computer and make some music. Less clicking, more picking.